Well, it looks like there's a few of us coming in. Um, I'm keen to get this underway. We've got a lot of great content to get through. So good evening and thank you for joining us for the first of our two-part webinar series with Morris Blackburn, Know Your Rights and Entitlements as a Bike Rider, Crashes Involving Motor Vehicles. My name is Anthea Hargreaves. I am Bicycle Network's General Manager of Public Affairs and Marketing, and I will be your host for this evening. But before we do begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we are all gathering in our various homes or workplaces and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are with us today. So if you have sustained an injury or been unlucky enough to sustain an injury while riding your bike, it is important to know where you stand. So tonight's webinar is brought to you by Bicycle Network membership and Morris Blackburn, Morris Blackburn where you will hear from Natalie Fleming, a Senior Associate of Road Accident Injuries at Morris Blackburn and Bicycle Network's own Chief Executive Officer, Craig Richards. This webinar will provide you with a greater understanding of your legal rights and entitlements as a person riding a bike, should you be in a crash involved in a, with a motor vehicle on a road in Victoria. Our speakers will focus on common crash scenarios such as left-hand turns, doorings, and the options or compensation available through the TAC should you sustain an injury while riding. We'll also look at what are your options if your bike is damaged in a crash. This webinar will be recorded and it will conclude with the Q&A. So please don't hesitate to use that Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen to ask any burning questions and we'll filter them out um, subject to time. I guess I, that's so, sort of all from me. So I will hand over the reins to Natalie Fleming from Morris Blackburn. Hi everyone. Um, thanks for attending the webinar. Uh, I'm going to try and share my screen now. So just bear with me while I bring that up. But whilst I do that, just to let you know, I'm a senior associate at Morris Blackburn Lawyers. I practice exclusively in the road injuries area. This is all I do and I've been doing this for about 10 years now. I'm also a very keen bike rider. So I have personal experience of what we go through on the roads as bike riders around cars, trams, trains and trucks. Let me just get this slide up and, can, and I'm just going to share my screen. Give me one second to get my screen up. Okay. Is that, can you see my screen? Yes, okay, great. All right. So just to give you some context, first of all, tonight I'll be talking mainly about the law of Victoria. Uh, it's fairly specific. It's a little bit different, the law of Victoria to other states. So I apologize for those of you who are joining us from other states. However, some of the themes around common law will be of benefit to those of you who are in other states tonight. One of the good things about being in the state of Victoria it is it is one of the better um, one of the better states to have an accident in. If there ever is a good place to have an accident, it is Victoria. Um, it's a statutory based scheme paid for by our registration fees. So when we register our vehicles, we pay a big proportion of that fee. I think it's somewhere between 75 and 80 percent of that fee goes to funding the Transport Accident Commission. And the Transport Accident Commission's main aim is to get us better when we've had an accident on the roads. So that's its sort of main purpose is to provide benefits around, particularly around medical and like benefits. Uh, the, there are two parts to the scheme. And so we'll talk about both parts. The first part that I'll talk about uh, more broadly because it applies to all of us if we're injured on the roads, uh, what they call the no fault benefits scheme part of the TAC scheme or the benefits regime. Uh, so basically, if you have an accident in, in, in Victoria and you're hit by a car, a train or a tram, or you have a near miss, which I'll come to in a sec that maybe ca causes you to take evasive action, but you don't actually collide with a vehicle, you are covered by the transport accident scheme. So we need to then define, well, what is a transport accident? And I think for cyclists, sometimes they don't seek to make a claim because they don't believe that they were directly injured by a vehicle. Uh, now, it's very straightforward. If you have two cars that hit each other, uh, you have a transport accident. If you have a, a car that hits a pedestrian, you have a transport accident and so on. But if you're in a bike, you're a fairly vulnerable road user you're moving reasonably quickly and you are making decisions at speed as well on the road. And if a car or a vehicle 
changes direction suddenly, you sometimes have to change direction suddenly um, and will fall or have some sort of accident that may not involve connection with a car. It's still a transport accident because a car's been involved. And I think that's really important because a lot of people sort of perhaps move to avoid a dooring or move to avoid a vehicle that's suddenly pulled into a park and find themselves on tram tracks that they never intended to be traveling on and have an accident on the tram tracks because they have been forced out of control by a vehicle. That is still a transport accident. Uh, it doesn't require contact with a vehicle in order for it to be a transport accident. And it also doesn't require a witness as well, which can be helpful because for many people who are involved in accidents where a car has done something erratic in front of them or around them, the, the, um, the person who's done that erratic movement, the driver, isn't quite, commonly is not aware that they've caused an accident. They, they continue on. They've, you know, perhaps come across some signage that surprised them. Perhaps they've been distracted. They've moved in a way or hit the brakes a little bit hard or sped up or accelerated in a way that seems uncomfortable. Uh, and you've moved out of the way. In order to do that, you've actually come off and say broken, broken a wrist or something like that. They're not aware of it quite often through no fault of their own, apart from the fact that they've done something uh, that's put you in danger, they've, they've headed off unknown, unknown, you know, unknowing that they've caused an accident or even an injury. Um, what you do need to do though, to protect yourself in those scenarios is make a report. So make a report to the police straight away. And the other thing is, is that I would also, if you're in a fit state, which sometimes you're not, you've just had a horrible experience on the road, if you're in a fit state to just, you know, to talk to the ambulance uh, officers when they arrive or to talk to people who stop to assist you, I would be telling them that's what has happened um, because we do need some baseline evidence to get a TAC claim in. So as long as you make a police report, um, as long as you're clear about what's occurred, you should be covered by the TAC. Now, a couple of things have changed recently. In the past, if you hit a parked car on your way to work, you were not covered by, by the TAC legislation. That changed as a result of an accident in 2014 from memory uh, by a gentleman by the name of Rory who hit the back of a truck um, between uh, work and home. And he was, he was injured to the point of paraplegia he put in a TAC claim and wasn't covered. And as a result, uh, we took that to the Supreme Court. It was it failed to jump the hurdle to become a TAC claim. But through Morris Blackburn's efforts and the efforts of some council and bicycle network, we were able to get that claim accepted retrospectively by changing the law. So effectively, if you're on a bike and you're traveling to or from work, you hit a parked vehicle, it will be considered to be a transport accident. If someone swerves at you uh, or does something erratic on the road and causes you to have an accident, even though there's been no contact, that is also a transport accident. So don't just assume that it isn't a transport accident. If a vehicle in any way, shape or form was responsible for you, and it doesn't matter if, who, who was at fault, if you're involved in an accident, uh, that you perhaps don't have contact with a vehicle, you are still covered by the TAC scheme. And that's a very important point, I think, as a bicycle, you know, as someone traveling on a bike. Uh, the opening of a door of a motor vehicle is also considered to be an accident. And of course, there are increased penalties for dooring uh, cyclists. And you do tend to find that there is a greater level of care taken by motorists now around dooring. What I would say to you is that there are two parts to the scheme. The first part we're talking about here is the no fault benefits. So if you get, um, if someone opens a door on you, you are covered under the no fault benefits. However, when we get to common law damages, that does change. And I will come back to that in a sec, but with a common law damages claim, so 
once you've found uh, someone's at fault, and I'll come back to this, you have to find that the driver of the vehicle had some role in the dooring for you to be covered, but we'll come back to that. So effectively, the most important thing I think for a cyclist is to know that any incident involving a motor vehicle, train or tram that is out of control, any incident involving your, your bike and a stationary motor vehicle, and any incident between a cyclist and the opening of a door uh, are covered under the Transport Accident Scheme. When we start to think about uh, what, what types of contact or non-contact need to be made for this to be a transport accident, it reminds me of a case I had some time ago with a Bicycle Network member who um, was injured when traveling up Russell Street uh, at the part where you go up past the Forum Theatre, during peak hour, I think you've got three lanes rolling into two lanes. And if you've got parked vehicles on the left-hand lane, which they shouldn't be there during peak hour, it becomes one lane. On this day, there were parked vehicles on that left-hand lane. And the cyclist was travelling in the left-hand lane with a lot of traffic behind her, uh, going from three lanes to one and she's pushing up that hill and unbeknownst to her there's another cyclist behind her fairly sort of fit uh, cyclist who's powering up the hill behind her under some pressure from vehicles and as they got to the top towards the uh, red light there or towards the stoplights there she pulls off around the left-hand side of those vehicles. So she's got parked cars on the left, she's coming past, and the minute she knows she can get out of the way of the traffic coming up in the right-hand lane that she's currently in, she pulls off into the left-hand lane. And as she pulls off, her chain slips. And as her chain slips, she puts her feet down onto the road because she's aware that she will slide backwards fairly quickly. It's a fairly steep hill there for those who know it. Behind her, another cyclist under pressure is powering up the road and he is looking behind him as he comes up because he's concerned about the cars behind him, I would suggest, doesn't see her and collides with her and pushes her into the curb, causing pretty horrific injuries to her teeth. He then calls triple O, her partner arrives on the scene, he's ahead of her in, a, in his bike, comes back, he hasn't actually seen the collision, um, an ambulance comes, they jump in the ambulance and leave. Now, because she had bicycle network insurance, she was covered for part of the uh, reconstruction of the teeth, but there was a lot of work to be done. When she went to the hospital, the hospital automatically put in a TAC claim. Hospitals have an interest in getting you into the scheme if you've been injured in a transport accident because that's who will be paying the bills. So they've put in a TAC claim, assuming that it's covered under the Transport Accident Act. And I would say that it is covered under the Transport Accident Act, except for when the TAC interviewed the other cyclist, he denied hitting her, unfortunately, uh, which meant that for us, it was very difficult to prove that vehicles were involved because it would have been a very straightforward argument to say, he's under pressure from vehicles. That's why he's been looking behind him and hit this woman, unfortunately, because he was perhaps embarrassed or didn't want to fess up to what had actually happened. Uh, he wouldn't say that, so we weren't able to fight that claim. But what we were able to do was actually have his insurance pay for the rest of her uh, dental work. So the combination of BN uh, membership and then having someone else who had home insurance that covered damages that they caused uh, was able to then cover the the uh, cover the cover the difference. That said, I, I should use that as an uh, as an example or an incident to show. Look, um, that was a transport accident. In some ways, it was a long bow to draw because he was under pressure from vehicles, but it was still those vehicles were still potentially a little bit out of control. They shouldn't have been all pushing into the lane the way they were. And also they were putting a cyclist under pressure, which wasn't appropriate. So do remember transport accident is, you know, a definition of a transport accident is wider than you think. And I think if you're under any, um, if you're under any sort of, you know, if you're confused at all, was it a transport accident? How much was this vehicle involved? 
I would still put in the claim to see if you can be covered under the scheme. They'll tell you if you can't. And if you're still unsure, then it's that's the time to bring a lawyer in and start looking at the facts of the matter and see if we can get it over the line. You also need to jump another threshold and that is, have I suffered an injury to get into the transport accident scheme? And again, this is something that, you know, a lot of people will have a mild bingle get back on their bike and ride home. And it's not until some months later that their ongoing neck pain or shoulder pain starts to become so problematic that they then seek medical help and have not put in a claim. So the Transport Accident uh, Commission covers any injury that has suffered as a result of the transport accident. And when we say any injury, we mean any injury that's been reported. So I always say to people, if you've had an accident, go to your doctor because you really don't know, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time you'll be fine in that your injuries will self-correct and you'll go on normally. However, in that small percent of cases which need ongoing medical assistance, if you haven't put in a claim uh, for an injury, then you would be considered to not have an injury. So I say to people, go to, the, go to the doctor. If you've got some bruising, tell them you've got some bruising. It needs to be recorded, the, uh, you know, what happened in the accident. So you report to the police, this is what happened. And then you report to a doctor and say, this is where I was hit. It may not be problematic now, but if you develop a problem in 12 months time, you've got no medical record of the actual injury. And it's the same with a mental injury or nervous shock, what the law calls nervous shock, but which is really PTSD any sort of psychological reaction to an accident should be reported again to your doctor, if it's mild, to a psychologist if you need assistance. Uh, this will then ensure that early reporting means that the TAC will be able to assist you. And you know, once you've put in the claim and you've had it accepted because it, it was a transport accident and you did suffer some injuries, then uh, you will then receive the benefits of the scheme if need be in the years to come. There's a problem too, if you don't put in an injury, um, you've got basic, if you don't put in a claim for your accident, so if you don't actually ring the TAC after having an accident, report to the police and report an injury to your doctor, then you've only got 12 months to put in that claim. If you leave it more than 12 months, you're going to struggle to get it in. The TAC will accept, they will accept a claim after 12 months, but there needs to be extenuating circumstances. And obviously where someone's terribly injured or where there's been, you know, difficult circumstances, they will consider it. But the short stop date is 12 months. You must put in a claim. And I must say that if you delay on putting in a claim, you know, the TAC is ultimately an insurer and like all insurers, they're suspicious. And as they are suspicious, they will potentially not accept the claim if too much time has gone past. So they're, they're really the two things that uh, you really need to be aware of is, you know, I've been in a transport accident or I think I've been in a transport accident and I have been injured and a lot of people say, oh, well, I don't want to make a fuss or it's just a bit of bruising, but we just really don't know until time has passed sometimes that actually that's an injury and it's going to cause me an ongoing problem. So again, it is just about turning up to the doctor and reporting the injury. Um, I won't go too much about the claims process in terms of eligibility because it's more for, um, more for uh, vehicle on vehicle accidents, but you're eligible to get into the scheme if the accident happened in Victoria or if it was a Victorian registered vehicle. So that's where it can be, um, or a vehicle that is able to be registered. So that's where you need the BN insurance for um, uh, bicycle accidents that happen where other bikes are involved. If say you're riding between jobs um, with your work, um, if say you're riding, say for example, from work to a function um, that work is putting on, then you're covered, you're covered uh, by the TAC scheme. So any sort of break in the work day, a mandated sort of drinks event, things like that, if you've ridden from work to that event and had an accident, then you're covered under work cover. 
So you don't need to put in a TAC claim, you'd need to put in a work cover claim for work cover statutory benefits, which include medicals, uh, loss of earnings, and potentially a small impairment benefit claim. Uh, I'll come back to then what happens with a work cover claim later, but in terms of work cover, once you're in the work cover scheme, you are then able to transition across to the transport accident scheme for your common law damages, um, which is the second part of the claim. But again, um, I would also uh, put in the work cover claim and see what they say. If the work cover doesn't accept you, then tra the Transport Accident Commission will accept you. And as I've said, putting in a claim, there's a 12 months, 12 months to put in a claim. Th up to three years, the TAC can accept the claim. And there is no discretion to accept the claim after three years. So for example, <clears throat> you know, I've had people ring me and they have had an accident five years ago and they put it, didn't put in a claim, didn't report an injury, didn't go to the police. If it's a day after the three year timeline, you are out and you can't get into the scheme. You can't then get the medical and like benefits. You can't get loss of earnings. You can't get the small lump sum payment, which I'll talk about in a minute. And you then cannot activate any common law damages that you might have if someone was at fault. And I'll come to those common law damages soon. If you're um, under the age of 18, when you have an accident, you have until the age of 21 to put in a claim. Um, it's not uncommon for minors for their parents to put in a claim for them. And what I would say to uh, <clears throat> all parents is that if you do put in a claim for your child, if they're injured in a transport accident on a bike or in any other regard, then you need to put in a claim and make sure that it's accepted because anything that they need later in life, if you've put in the claim, you've taken that time limit away. As in, you put in a claim, they say, no, you've got 12 months to dispute that decision. If you don't do anything about that decision, then they're out of the scheme. So I always say to parents, make sure, and generally what I do with minors claims is I, I make sure that the claim's gone in and been accepted so that they're protected. So <clears throat> if someone hasn't put in a claim, then the, the minor has up until they're 21. But if someone's already put in a claim and it's not been accepted for whatever reason, they need to push to make sure it is accepted because that person will be again kept out of the scheme if they go past that date. Once you've put in a claim, the TAC have 21 days to accept the claim or to ask for further reasonable information. So it's not uncommon if they think that, you know, another vehicle wasn't involved or, you know, how does the, what's the injury? Um, in particular with psych injuries, they generally want proof and they want assessments done to prove that there's been a psychological injury the TAC will write back and ask that this is what we want. We want this extra information. We want you to go to a medical exam. Um, we want you to provide further evidence. Uh, generally, they might even send out an investigator to have a look at the circumstances of the accident. So once you're in the scheme, <clears throat> you know, for many people, they might get into the scheme, but never actually have to use it which is a great thing because that's what you want. You want uh, to make sure you're protected, but hopefully recover and recover quickly. But the main benefit of the scheme is for medical disability rehabilitation and like services. This is a very wide scope that the TAC pays for. <clears throat> the TAC will pay for all medicals and all medical treatment that is required, that is reasonable as a result of the transport accident. And that includes private uh, assistance. So I always say to people, look, once you've been through the hospital system, if you've been in hospital, first of all, the TAC will generally then in your rehab, in your rehab treatment, send you to a private rehab hospital, but also for people who are doing outpatient uh, rehab, um, the TAC will pay for them to go privately. You just need to organise it. 
if you're not happy with the surgeon that you've seen or you want a second opinion or you don't want to wait in the queue, you can go privately for, for every aspect of your medical treatment. And that is designed to get you back uh, back and uh, back and writing again as soon as possible, basically. Uh, and again, getting as many opinions as you want. I say to all of my clients, what you want to do now is really focus on your recovery. The more you put in now, the better you'll go over the long term. If we have to put in a legal claim, we will. But let's just focus on the recovery at this point. That's what the TAC is there for. Now, the TAC are a little bit sneaky, though, in that over the years, their medical expenses have gone up. And as an insurer, they like to keep those medical expenses as, uh, as low as they can. And so they have um, started to put out policy rates for treatment. So for physio, osteo, et cetera, they might pay $60 when you're paying 120. That's not reasonable. It's a policy, not the law and can be challenged. So all of those aspects of the claim can be challenged if the TAC says, oh, we're not paying for something that you think is needed. If they say that you, um, you know, we're only paying for part of what is needed, that can all be challenged. In addition, the TAC can pay uh, after the medical night benefits, they can pay um, loss of earnings. For the first 18 months after a transport accident, they pay what's known as loss of earnings at about 80% of your pre-accident earning wage. It's capped at about $1,300 a week at the moment from memory. And uh, they will then also, if you continue not be, to be able to work after 18 months, they'll pay a loss of earnings capacity benefit it's the same thing effectively, but what they do do at that 18 month mark is start to assess, well, can you do seven hours a week? Can you do 14 hours a week? But again, um, it's effectively 80% of your wage for up to three years, if need be. If say you have a horrific accident and you're injured to what we call an impairment level of 50% and above, which is devastating, that sort of accident att attracts, a, you know, um, a uh, loss of earnings capacity payment until normal retirement age. So if you had an accident at 20, you couldn't work again because of your injuries, you would be covered for 80% of your earnings at the age of 20 up until the age of 65. I think it's 67 now actually. And then the last benefit that's available to you under the uh, <clears throat> no fault benefit scheme is what's known as an impairment benefit. It's a small lump sum for permanent injury, and it is very small. Uh, it includes psychological and physical injuries, but they are injuries that are what we call objective. They're objective measurements. So for example, if you broke your wrist and it was fused, they would measure what you should be able to do in terms of movement versus what you can do, and then assign a percentage to that injury. They then add up all the impairment percentages that apply to all of your injuries. And if you score above 10%, you receive a small lump sum benefit of around $8,000. You've got six years to claim this benefit and you generally are better off with a lawyer assisting you with this uh, just to make sure that the assessments are done correctly and that all assessments are done before uh, the final determination is made. Um, minors can also get an impairment benefit as well. Um, if a child suffers more than 10% uh, impairment, they can get a small weekly amount up until their 18th birthday, when then they can also be assessed for adult impairment benefit. They can also receive some payments, loss of earnings payments as well, depending on the circumstances. So that's the statutory benefit scheme Everyone who's involved in a transport accident who has an injury, whether it be physical or psychological, is accepted into that part of the scheme. This second part of the scheme that we call the fault-based part of the scheme, this is where you can claim common law damages for pain and suffering and economic loss. And you have two thresholds that you need to jump to get to this point. One is you must have suffered a legally defined serious injury an illegally defined serious injury uh, requires that you are either assessed in your permanent impairment as having a 30% or 
or more whole person impairment claim, or you have a serious long-term impairment to your body function, meaning that you are struggling to work, um, enjoy life in the way that you used to, sleep, there's pain, ongoing issues like that, that are going to be permanent and long-term. So if you've suffered a serious injury and we can determine that you've suffered a serious injury, then you are eligible to sue whoever caused these injuries uh, for pain and suffering and economic loss. Now, in order to do that, the second threshold is that, that someone must be negligent. And whoever the negligent party is, so if someone is at fault for your accident, the TAC stands in their shoes, as in the TAC directly insures that person. And by directly insuring them, what it does mean is, first of all, you're not required to, <clears throat> you're not required to sue an individual who may not have any money. Uh, you're only required to in, uh, sue an insurer. And quite often the person that you do sue may not even know that this person sued. They've probably only had to have, make a statement at some point. They'll never know that the person sued. So there's never any, it's not personal. It just is about an insurer providing a payment. Now, as I said, you must be able to show that the injuries were caused by another person. Um, and you must commence the claim within six days, uh, six years of the uh, transport accident. And individuals who are, so children who are injured must commence the claim before the day before their 24th birthday. You can uh, stretch time on these if you need to. It's not recommended. If someone has an entitlement, you want to bring that entitlement uh, up as soon as possible. Now, once you've sued for common law damages for pain and suffering and economic loss, that is the end of that part of the claim, but the medical and like benefits go on for the rest of your life. Um, and which is, which is useful in other states, generally you have to sue for everything, you have to sue for your future medical benefits as well. So the TAC as a scheme, I think, is, um, uh, is always supporting the physical well-being of uh, people covered under it in order to try and get people back to where they need to be, which I think is a great part of the scheme. But yeah, in order to actually jump into this part of the scheme, the second part, your injuries must be serious. And so that means they must be above 30% impaired. You must be above 30% impaired or you must have a you must have someone who is at fault for the accident that's clearly at fault for the accident. If the TAC makes a decision once you're in the scheme that you're not happy with, such as not paying for all of your physiotherapy, uh, not paying for your occupational therapy, not paying for any educational expenses that might you might need, not paying for any retraining or rehab that you might need or not paying for the full amount of some medical treatment that's required. You've got 12 months from the date of that decision to do something about it. You can't do anything about it after the 12 months. And you can issue what we call a dispute application, which is part of an informal process to look at why the TAC has made that decision and why you believe it to be wrong. An informal dispute can be lodged or review of the decision can be lodged by yourself. A dispute application is generally um, better done by a lawyer, but I do find it's better to question them first. They do make significant admi administrative errors and sometimes uh, it takes a call to sort of sort those things out. But otherwise that's a strict limit. If you, if, you're, if you put in a TAC claim and they say, no, we're not covering you for these reasons, if you do nothing about it, you, it within 12 months, then you're out of the scheme. And that's the most crucial part is to get into the scheme. If they say, we're not paying for any more physio and you need physio for a long time to come and you do nothing about it uh, over 12 months, then you're out of, out of physio. So any letter that you get from the TAC that says it's a decision, it's important to note the date that you receive the letter, the date of the letter and seek, uh, seek assistance with disputing that decision if you're unhappy with it. So I think that's about all I have to cover at the moment. I hope I haven't uh, gone through too fast for you, but I'm happy to take questions after Craig comes on.
Thank you so much, Natalie. What an amazing amount of information we've got there. And as I did say at the start, we are recording this. So we will make this available to our members and to those who have registered for this webinar today. I know that for the average writer, it is incredibly tough um, to you know, understand which circumstances compensation is likely to be granted or denied. So I really do hope that some people have some more clarity after your presentation. Um, I guess it's also good to remember that if you don't, if you you don't need to be directly hit by a vehicle in order to be eligible for TAC coverage. And I guess in that instance, if you are ever unsure, please don't hesitate to give Bicycle Network a call. Um, next up, I will throw it to Craig, our CEO, um, who'll discuss what your options are if your bike is damaged in a crash, and then we'll move on to the Q and A's. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Anthea. Hey, one thing I just wanted to say before I get into that bit is um, one thing that I think is obviously a policy issue that all us bike riders should remember. Natalie was mentioning how our registration fees pay for the TAC scheme. Um, so make sure we keep that in mind. So whenever someone says to you, you're not paying for the roads because you're not paying registration. Well, we all know one, we do have a registration anyway, most of us do have a vehicle, but two, that money doesn't go to pay for the roads. So it's just a good thing to remember. I'm not gonna speak for very long, mainly because I wanna give you a chance to ask some questions, because I'm sure a lot of you ha who have um, um, listening in and are viewing in is because you've got things you really wanna talk about. So I'm just gonna talk about four things that I think are really important when it comes to what happens to your bike, because often um, when there is a crash and your bike's damaged, you wanna be able to get that repaired, replaced. What should you do? So I'll talk a little bit about when you can take action for the damage to your bike, a little bit about what to do um, on the spot, and then what to do from an insurance perspective. And then the last one is, what can we do to try and get the money back so that we can help you get your bike repaired, get you back on um, riding as soon as we can. So the first one I wanted to talk about was when you can actually bring a claim. And as it was mentioned with the TAC claim, it's a no fault scheme. But generally here, the situation is when your bike's damaged, it needs to be the fault of the person driving the vehicle. The good news is um, that we know that the vast majority of the time, we know that over 80% of the time when there is a crash, it is the fault of the person driving the vehicle. So most of the time, you will have a way to try and get your money back when there's a vehicle involved. The sort of situations, and we've been doing quite a few of these cases lately for a number of our members, the things that have come up and the ways that bike riders have uh, we've been able to get money back for uh, members whose bikes have been damaged has been things like a car's turned right at an intersection in front of a bike rider who's going straight ahead, a car's turned left at an intersection when a bike rider is going straight ahead and is already well into the intersection. Um, we've had a couple of close passes when the car has um, come too close to the bike and knocked the bike rider off. Um, we've had one interesting one where this was actually the bike, our member's bike was on the back of the car and another car rear-ended the car. So that was another one, damaged the bike, not riding it at the time. Um, had a couple where we've had people, pedestrians or young ch children who've run out onto the road into the path of bike riders as well. Um, we've had some of the classic ones too, where people driving cars through their inattention have gone through stop signs, give way signs, um, those sorts of things. So they're the sort of bundle of things that we encounter on the road. Some of those are what we know as a classic bike crashes, left turns, right turns, close passes, um, those things when your bike can get damaged. So in those cases, when it's the fault of the person who is driving the vehicle, then we can do something about it. The first thing to do is what do you do on the spot when there is a crash? Your bike's damaged, hopefully you're okay. Um, you might not be, that can create create more difficult as well, but get the names of obviously the person driving the car. Sometimes if they do leave the scene and we have some of those, it makes it more difficult. Make sure you get the number plate, get the names, get details, as many details as you can. There are some at times when we know we've had a few recently where the person driving the car has been um, not very forthcoming with that um, and we've had to chase it down and that can be more difficult. So get as many details as you possibly can. Take some photos while you're there. If you obviously you're well enough to do so, that's a good thing to do as well. Um, and make a careful note about what happened. So there's some good things to do on the spot. Um, the third thing just to talk about, often the person driving the vehicle has insurance um, and their insurer will then um, you know, recognize that their driver's at fault. That can be difficult. So we have quite a few members who we help them when the insurer stalls, as you would expect, insurers don't like paying out money, they can stall. Um, the job there is really keep the pressure on the insurer 
they will take as long as they possibly can. Um, they, you might have to provide some um, things to them, but really keep the pressure on the insurer. Don't let the drift at their pace because that will take a long time. Um, and we can help with that if need be. Um, the fourth one is, well, what do you do with the person? How do you then what do, you had the crash, then what the circumstance? The best thing you do is you ring them up quickly. Um, you obviously should usually get quotes for repairs and those sorts of things, but you ring them and we try and talk them into saying, hey, you said, you know, it was your fault, time to pay up. So we try and do that as best we can. Um, first up, just through having a chat. Um, Second one, if that doesn't work, then some of you probably heard, then we send the letter, which is a letter saying, hey, you've caused this crash. It's your fault. It's due to your negligence. It's time to pay. Um, generally then, the next step after that, so first one, call, try and talk them, get them to pay. Second one, send the letter. Third one, call them again, um, because often people don't respond to those letters, um, particularly people who are reluctant to pay, who haven't paid at the first step. So third one is we call them again, say, hey, this is your chance. You better pay or else, the next thing's coming, that will mean we'll issue court proceedings against you. And then the amount of the claim will go up because there's costs of doing that. So we try and do it again. Then the next one is, if that doesn't work out, then we issue the court proceedings and on we go from there. So people often ask us, how long does it take to try and get your money back? Well, if the person puts their hand up, does the right thing, recognises they made a mistake, sometimes it can take a few days. Um, but if they don't and they really want to stretch out, unfortunately, it can take months. So that's the sort of process we have to go through. There can be a number of steps involved, but um, if you do happen to have that situation where it's clearly the other person's fault and you, your bike has been damaged, um, the most important thing is we don't give up. We make sure we keep pressing and keep pushing until we can do the best result we can and do everything we can to possibly get compensation for the person whose precious bike has been damaged. That's my quick summary. So Anthea, I'll go back to you and I'm back. Question thank time. You. Thank you so much, Craig. I guess, you know, the big takeaway from that is that absolutely Bicycle Network has your back when you have been involved in a crash. Um, and we'll do everything we can to help with support from our partners at Morris Blackburn. So there have been a few questions. Um, I've gone through, we'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, I might start with the longest one. Bear with me as I just pull up the questions. Um, TFJ posted a bit of a scenario. Um, so Natalie, bear with me as I throw this to you. Um, so last week I was involved in an accident where I was legally cycling slowly on the inside of an Uber. The Uber was the second car stopped at a red light outside the Southern Cross station. The passengers started to suddenly hop out without looking and my bike hit the edge of the passenger door. I was not injured, but my expensive road bike was extensively damaged. I'm claiming on home and contents insurance. However, two questions. One, is the driver or the passenger responsible in this case? And two, what are my chances or my insurance company's chances of getting funds from the Uber's insurance? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the passenger uh, dooring, which I was going to come back to anyway, and thank you for prompting with that question. So if um, Ubers, it depends on how Ubers are insured. Some Uber drivers don't have any insurance, extra insurance. They're just insured as a normal uh, road vehicle. They're not paying any commercial registration fee. And so for injuries, that can be an issue, but also for property as well, that can be an issue. Um, I have someone who's been injured after being hit on the left-hand side by a passenger getting out of a vehicle. And the courts currently won't recognise uh, damages for injuries caused by a passenger because that passenger is not indemnified by the TAC scheme. However, with property damage, I would certainly be trying to pursue both the Uber driver to see if they do have insurance and the person that got out of the vehicle. Arguably, under the common law currently, you would say that the passenger is responsible because the Uber driver doesn't necessarily have control of the passenger's actions. If the Uber driver had pulled up there and there was no traffic in front of them, so it made a clear decision to pull up at that point and the passenger had gotten out on the left-hand side illegally, then you would have a very clear case against the Uber driver. Whether you could get the insurer to pay, I don't know. Um, because that passenger's possibly taken a bit of a, uh, you know, I'll just jump out here type of approach, uh, that has, um, that then to me suggests that the passenger is more at fault in this instance. But I'd certainly be going both parties 
to try and get your road bike paid for because, yes, it's uh, hideously expensive. This is an issue because the cyclists are pushed down the left-hand side of the road and quite commonly now um, we've got bike lanes on the left-hand side of the road that some of which are now being separated from traffic, but many aren't. And as you ride down the left-hand side of the road, although it's a TAC claim and that you'd get your medical benefits covered, um, in terms of common law damages, you won't get it potentially, although we're working to change that law if a passenger doors you. Um, and it is difficult. Uh, Uber drivers are notorious for having not very much insurance or insurance that won't pay once they find out that the vehicle's being used for a commercial purpose. So that would be my yeah. slightly depressing answer to that question. Well, uh, yeah, the one thing I'd just add to Natalie's um, response there is the insurance is interesting. You know, people think just because that the person driving the vehicle, their insurance is the whole key, mm. but it's really not. That just that's their problem whether they've got insurance or not. Obviously, they may not they might not have the funds to pay. That's another issue. Mm. But you can still pursue mm. the person who opened the vehicle if they've been negligent, and the driver might have been negligent as well. They've advised the person to hop out. So just because they've got insurance, whether they have or they haven't, doesn't mean you can get you can't get your money back. All it means is where will that money come from? That's the one thing to think about. People That's think right. it's all dependent upon the person's insurance, but it's not. Because often we have that situation where the person um, driving the vehicle says, it's not my problem, it's my insurance insurer's problem. And we say, no, 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 no. That's Your insurance is your business. That's not our business. Our business is you have done the wrong thing and you need to compensate the person involved. Great. Well, I... I hope that answers your question, DFJ. Um, we do have another question. Oh, I've got a couple from Andrew as well. So does a vehicle need to be involved either via direct collision or avoidance of erratic movement by a vehicle in the accident on a road with regard to a cyclist to be eligible for TAC? Or does a single cyclist accident also qualify? Example, mechanical failure, which results in an accident. No, so a vehicle has to be involved. So a mechanical failure doesn't, uh, doesn't count under the scheme requires that a, a vehicle is involved. And that could be a tram, a train, a bus, a truck, or a, or a car. There was a question in the chat whether or not it matters where the vehicle's registered. So it, if it was an interstate vehicle? If it was an interstate vehicle, then for common law damages, uh, it would be a different scenario. But to get into the TAC scheme, it's happened in Victoria. Uh, so you would certainly be eligible for the TAC scheme in Victoria. But and you would get all of the medical and like benefits, the impairment benefit and the loss of earnings under the TAC scheme. However, for common law damages, you would then need to sue the interstate insurer. Right. And so that and that, uh, you know, the law of Victoria applies, but the interstate insurer has to indemnify the driver and pay your claim. Right. Hey, one question, Nat Natalie, can I just ask? I'm going to throw this one in. Well, what yep. if you're driving your Victorian um, vehicle interstate? That's often an interesting one as well. So again, if, you, if you're driving a Victorian registered vehicle interstate um, and it's registered in Victoria, then you'll be covered under the TAC legislation. So again, you'll get medical and like benefits, uh, loss of earnings and impairment benefit. And if you then say hit someone in South Australia, your common law damages, you know, if they were negligent would have to be claimed in South Australia. So under South Australian law, so the damages would be capped at a, a South Australian law by their insurer. And that law would apply. So you've got a six year time limit to claim damages in Victoria, but you've got a three year time limit to claim damages in South Australia. I have had instances where people have gone on uh, motorbike trips both Victorian registered um, hit each other. Uh, so they're both covered under the scheme because they're Victorian registered. However, the claim occurred in Western Australia. So Western Australian law applies, but the damages limit is Victorian. So, Right. Um, Andrew's got another question. So to what extent is there a burden of proof on the, oh, sorry, is the burden of proof on the cyclist to make the claim either to the TAC um, for personal injury or for property damage? For personal injury, um, in terms of, say, you say that a vehicle cut you off and that's why you had the accident, there is uh, no requirement under the legislation for witnesses. So as long as you've made that claim and you've reported it to the police, then you should be able to get into the system. They may investigate your claims, 
but generally we can get those across the line, it might be a fight. In terms of property damage, uh, that again is different. It's a different area of law. However, um, it helps with property damage if you have a witness, but really what helps with property damage as Craig has pointed out is can they pay ultimately? You know, can you say that's the person that caused the accident and can they pay? You know, whether that's through their insurance or through their hip pocket, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's yeah, one interesting thing just to add. Oh, oh, sorry. I was just going to talk about a little bit about the burden of proof, which is an interesting potential campaign, which a lot of people are interested in. While um, Natalie's correct, if it's a property damage claim, of course, under Australian law, the person bringing the claim does carry the burden of proving that the other person um, was at fault or negligent. But one thing that's often raised is in some places in Europe, and it's often spoken about as it's called this reverse onus law, where they yeah. talk about, well, maybe that law should be changed. So mm. the person who, um, you know, I, I don't really like using the word often, but it's sort of the vulnerable road user shouldn't, there should be a reverse onus. So if you do hit a bike rider um, with your vehicle, you should have to prove mm. that they weren't at fault rather than they have to prove that you were at fault. And that's a campaign that we've um, started in Australia a little bit, but we haven't really ramped it up. But that's one on our list, which is a very interesting one, because um, it's really a way of making sure that when people are driving vehicles, they really need to look out mm. for everyone on a bike, because obviously the consequences of being hit um, by a massive piece of metal is pretty severe. Yeah, and I absolutely. think, too, in countries where they have brought that in, there's been a reduction in um, vehicle and bike accidents because of that extra care that's taken. Yeah, it's definitely a message we're trying to get through, that every mm. time you're out driving, expect to see a bike rider, because if you mm. don't, you just won't see them. Um, we do have a, another question from Darren, which has come through. So if you are not riding to and from work, rather recreational riding, and you're involved with an accident with a vehicle, are you covered? Yes. Yes, you are. Great, nice and simple answer for you, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> um, I do have one more question which hasn't been raised yet. And I guess it's something that we wanted to touch on um, for Bicycle Network and it's something that people might not know of. But how, Natalie, this is for you. So how does the TAC function in the event that someone is involved in an accident um, and passed away? Can the deceased family make a claim for compensation? Yes, uh, I. There is, um, there, is depend, there are dependency benefits under the statute-based scheme. So there is a lump sum payment for dependents. So you need to be dependent as in uh, a child or uh, you know, a grandchild who's dependent on that person uh, or a partner. Uh, there's a, an amount put aside for funeral. There's an amount put aside for counseling. There's an amount put aside for travel to and from funeral. Um, and there is a lump sum amount that is adjusted depending on the age of the person when they are deceased. If you're a partner of someone that's been um, killed by, uh, you know, their part, your partner's been killed in a transport accident on a bike, um, then you are eligible for five years of their wage at 80% of their wage, uh, as well as the lump sum. If you're a child uh, and you are the main dependent, say, then you are eligible for a lump sum that goes into a trust account through state trustees, I think from memory, and you get an educational benefit and a couple of other bits and pieces. If someone's been negligent and caused the death, then there is the ability to sue for wrongs act damages for again, uh, pain and suffering and any further economic loss that may uh, have occurred as a result of the loss of uh, of that person. So there's a significant amount of claims that can be made. I find that the TAC is pretty good about reaching out to people to let them know that they can make the claim, but it is certainly something to uh, pursue or advise someone of if, um, if that has occurred, that unfortunate event has occurred. Yeah, look, it's something that we did want to raise just to make sure, you know, it, if you ever are unfortunate enough, there is support out there. Um, and again, if you do have any questions, Bicycle Network is here to help and support you in any way that we can. Um, Natalie, there is a question from Ian and I'm not sure that you can answer if this is not your area of expertise, but Ian is in New South Wales and is there, do you know much about what aspects are different between the New South Wales and Victorian schemes? My understanding with the New South Wales scheme is that it's, it's an insurer-based scheme. So you've got your private insurance, it's not a state-based insurer. 
And I think that's the great thing about Victoria, sorry, Ian, uh, is that we do have a state-based insurer who um, runs at a profit, uh, but also doesn't have a vested interest in rating that profit or providing, uh, you know, dividends to shareholders so that that money can then be used for campaigning and for safer roads and for uh, increased expertise in treating motor vehicle accidents. Uh, so in New South Wales, your claim would be directly against the, uh, uh, the driver of the vehicle. And I'm not 100% sure that they, that they will accept a no-fault claim. I think what it is is that there's a negligence element that has to be proven for any damages to be provided. Yeah, I hope that help answers your question, Ian. Thank you so much, Natalie. Um, look, there is one more question from John Holland, but I feel like that kind of ties into mm. my next webinar because the question is, what is the ruling if I have an accident hitting a pothole or a sunken manhole cover and no other vehicle is involved? And John, if you do tune into our webinar in the next month, we are going through those circumstances where Morris Blackman have a specialist lawyer who looks after this area, Dimmy, and I believe she's listening now so she can prepare this question for you. Um, I don't know if Natalie and Craig wanted to have a go at it or we can leave it for next time. I think that's Dimmy's area and I think Great. it's worthwhile waiting for. So. <laughs> We won't, we won't steal all of Dimmy's content before in this webinar. So that does wrap up our webinar um, in partnership between Bicycle Network membership and Morris Blackburn for this evening. Thank you so much, Natalie and Craig, for joining us and everyone that has tuned in. And we really hope that, you know, you do see that a Bicycle Network membership is so much more than just bike riding insurance. So whether you've had a crash or you feel like you've been wronged out on the road, our legal support means we've got your back every time you ride. Um, so whether you have a crash, alteration on the road, or just need help understanding your rights, we're your first point of contact. We've got your back. And if you're in need of legal support, our partner law firm, Morris Blackburn, will provide you with consultation at no charge. So I really hope that this was um, informative for everyone. You did get a lot out of it. We will circulate this so that you can refer back to it if you need. Thanks again, Craig and Natalie, and thanks everyone for tuning in. Thanks. Thanks everyone. Good to see thanks. you. Thanks.